Um, welcome. Uh, my name is John Jennings. I'm a professor of media and cultural studies. Uh, tonight we'll be having a discussion entitled Afrofuturistic Fright Night Funkstication, um, looking at the intersections between Afrofuturism, black exploitation, funk, and black horror. And um, basically, this is part of a relaunch of uh, the Museum of Uncut Funk. And we're basically joined by a, a gaggle of wonderful scholars. And I want them to everyone to introduce themselves before we kind of jump into some questions. Hi, my name is Pamela, AKA Sister Too Funky. I'm co-founder of the Museum of Uncut Funk. My name is Lorreen, and I am co-founder and co-curator of the Museum of Uncut Funk. My name is uh, David F. Walker. The F stands for Funktavious, and I am a writer <laughs> and educator. Uh, my name is Tim Fielder. The F stands for Not Funky Enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my name is Tanana Reeve, that voodoo that you do. Uh, I teach Afrofuturism and Black Horror at UCLA. I'm also a writer and screenwriter. Hi, my name is Kenitra D. Brooks, and the D means, damn, that was funky. And that is the John and Leslie, wait, who am I? Oh, wait, sorry. I am the Audrey and John Leslie Endowed Chair at Michigan State University in the English Department. Right. And, and thank you for doing that. So, so the reason why we all got together is because there's been obviously like a huge resurgence of uh, black speculative culture, you know, in, across all media, right? And but but it also has like some roots in some earlier uh, iterations of like black speculative culture, like funk and like you know um, early like black exploitation and things of that nature, and, on, and even before that. So first of all, I want to uh, ask uh, Pam and Lorraine, like, what is the Museum of Uncut Funk? Where can we find it? How did it start? And, and kind of a follow-up question would be like, why is it important to archive Black material culture in this way, the way that you have been doing it? Well, you know, we started the museum probably about 15 years ago, uh, more or less. And it really came from a love of collecting 1970s Black culture. Um, when I initially met Lorraine, she had a collection of animation art and one of the things I asked her was, where was all the black cartoons? And from that point forward, we started collecting the original um, cells, uh, storyboards, and drawings from all the cartoons from the 1970s. From there, we went to movie posters and um, coins and anything and everything based in 1970s black culture before and after. And for me personally, the 70s is a decade that nobody really focuses on. It's like we went from the civil rights movement right into hip hop. <laughs> and the 70s was just an explosion of blackness. And it, it, when I look back on it, it's almost as if it was the first time we were free to be black without having, I mean, the man always had his foot on our neck but we were free in the way we expressed ourselves, our style, our communication with one another, dance, culture, everything across the board. And that has never been replicated. I mean, it, it, it has transformed itself into different beings, mm -hmm. none of which I can identify with. Mm -hmm. So I'm clearly a child of the 70s and I'm just stuck there. Yeah, I, I too am stuck in the 70s. I think you know, when we started collecting stuff, it was stuff that we just loved because we remembered it and it was nostalgic when we were kids. But I think as we built this collection and kind of looked around and said, okay, great, we've got all this great stuff, what do we do with it? Then it, we started to realize, gee, we've got some really interesting things. You know, coming out of civil rights, kind of everything in our collection is a first. The first positive representations of people in animation, for example, um, which is why those cartoon cells are so important. The first, you know, um, powerful representations of black people in film. And we can debate, you know, the merits of, of black exploitation, but, you know, you did have black females leading action films. You had, you know, black people triumphing over the man. I mean, that was not a small thing considering how we had been portrayed prior to that period. Mm -hmm. um, so everything was funky. 
you know, our clothes, our language, everything was funky. So we just, we love that period. And again, it's not really one that's studied a lot from an academic perspective. Um, certainly not one that is um, kind of curated around a lot in terms of, you know, some of the pop culture artifacts. But, you know, my memory of, of the 70s is black was beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Say it loud and say it proud. You know, I had a big red afro that was huge and bell bottoms. And I mean, so you know, we, you know, put our put our picks in our hair and everything was just funky. Right. You know, so it was it was a it was a very cool period of time to grow up in. Um, you know, not saying that everything was perfect, but um, you know, we do look back on it fondly, um, and obviously we collect around it, and we're you know hoping to continue to curate exhibitions that travel, and just to you know kind of bring unknown aspects of 70s black history uh, to a lot of people. So everybody kind of understands, you know, where, um, you know, the decade kind of fits. I mean, it is the foundation for hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, of what has driven hip hop and made it, you know, worldwide culture is, is comes from the 70s. So it, it needs some respect, put some respect on it. And, um, you know, we need to, you know, to pay homage to the people that made it so funky as well. Um, so that's really what, what we're all about. We just got into it because we loved it and started collecting and we're just we're trying to turn it into a thing. Mm -hmm. um, everybody aware of, you know, how, how cool and how funky the seventies was. And, you know, I, I will now say my funk name. It is Rini D, uh, Rini the funk baby, red funk baby. So I don't know <laughs> any of those things. <laughs> Big baby Jesus. I'm sorry. I just thought about, it. I just thought about, uh, Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the thing. so some of the artifacts that you have in the collection are movie posters. And of course, there were like, um, you know, a number of like uh, horror movies during like the black exploitation era, right? So um, this is kind of like for, this question is kind of for uh, Tanana Reeve and David a little bit. So could you give us, because Tanana Reeve is also uh, one of the uh, producers of Horror Noir, which was this wonderful uh, um, um, documentary uh, uh, for uh, Shudder, which basically mm -hmm. looks at like the history of representations of black folk in film. Mm -hmm. So um, just kind of like give you that background. And of course, David is also a cultural critic and film critic for many years actually uh, was, was a uh, critic of film as well before he started even writing comics, which he's awesome at as well. So um, give us a little bit of background on like some of the history of like black people in film as far as like Early, early black representations around horror, and and also how that kind of like segues into black exploitation. You know, what are the connections between some of these early uh, filmic representations? You know, from from way back in the day up until say the black exploitation era. And that's kind of and and, and I wanted to kind of like kind of ping pong between uh, David and Tanari on that question. Well, I, I'll just thumbnail it a little bit. Um, okay. <laughs> We, talk, we talked about it. And horror noir, you know, starting out as the monster, really going back to Birth of a Nation in 1915 with the black face, the black man, uh, black male monstrosity, uh, the, the cooning and the feeds don't fail me now era where we were sort of the comic relief, the childlike person exhibiting the fears. So that's just the thumbnail of up until the mm -hmm. black exploitation era. When you get in 1972, something like Blackula, which, you know, people can make fun if they want to of uh, the costumes and whatever. But look, this was a groundbreaking film. Young black man directing it. William yep. Crane, only black guy on the set, basically. Uh, how he got that gig, I will never understand. But but good for him. And as as we often see when black creators had an opportunity to show themselves, to depict themselves in film, like in 1940s, Son of Ngagi which was Spencer Williams, written by Spencer Williams, who was in Amos and Andy later. But he did, in Son of Ngagi, in 1940, he took his opportunity to say, yeah, we got a scientist, we got a lawyer, we got a police detective, we have the whole spectrum of black life in this film, not what you have seen portrayed. And I think William Crane and, and Blackula goes in with a similar attitude. You know, those films were meant to be money machines. No right. one, you know, nobody at the studio was trying to elevate the culture, uh, as mm -hmm. far as I understand, but it, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but they were like, okay, we have a black vampire where we're gonna call him Mama Walde and he's gonna speak Swahili. And this film is going to begin with him trying to negotiate the end of the uh, transatlantic slave trade and just trying to elevate the culture and blackness, uh, beating up those cops, you know, <laughs> which is coming back into fashion now mm -hmm. uh, in black horror. 
and I think that that they were really trying to, even in a lesser film, like I, I would say like Abby, also from the 1970s, mm -hmm. which, which has its issues of uh, still black professor and, and the family and, and the preservation of the family and all this kind of thing were important messages underpinning these, these films that were really meant to be just sort of money turners from the studio standpoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So David, how, how did you come to black exploitation and, and how do you, and, and how, I guess kind of articulate some of your some of your feelings about some of the the horror that was that was in those uh, those stories too and funk and horror I guess yeah uh, yeah you know um, well I I grew up in the seventies and my grandparents had the subscriptions to Ebony and Jet magazine which is sort of your introduction to to everything you know in in that era that time frame and. Um, so I would flip through those magazines and I would see pictures and I would see advertisements for movies that I wasn't allowed to go see. <laughs> right. Like that piqued my curiosity. You know, like I, I, I knew who Pam Greer was, but I wasn't allowed to go see Pam Greer movies. And um, and so it was it was like this forbidden fruit for me. And then by the time I was old enough to see this stuff, the home video revolution had started. So I, I really wanted to delve in to all this stuff that I missed as a kid. But by that point, a lot of it was gone and forgotten. So it, it also became this, you know, this curiosity to me, like how could all of these movies that I remember seeing, you know, in, in Ebony and Jet and places like that, how come they're so hard to find? How come there's, there's not much that you can read about them? And this was right around the same time that I was getting really serious about the study of film. Yeah. And, and so the two sort of coalesced, they came together and um, and then I just became endlessly fascinated with the with those movies, um, in part because I recognized that, you know, as a kid growing up in the 70s and then into the 80s with with hip hop, I, I was already seeing the connections between the two and that um, and that that voice of hip hop that was um, that was so prevalent in my my teen years was being informed a lot by these images that were that we were, you know, Three the Hard Way and, and mm -hmm. Enter the Dragon, Black Belt Jones. So then, but in terms of horror, it was interesting because, you know, Blackula was one of those movies that was actually, um, it was one of the handful of black exploitation movies that was on TV with any degree of, of regularity. And, and so I'd seen it long before I'd seen a lot of the other movies. And, you know, and to me it was fascinating because, and what I did, I didn't know at the time, um, was that what I was seeing, I was seeing for the first time, which was this representation of like African royalty right. that wasn't a cat with like a bone through his nose and in a loincloth and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and so to me, that was really profound because it was like, oh, wait a sec, you know, all the imagery of, of Africa that I had seen up to that point was steeped in these real negative stereotypes. Um, and what I think is fascinating about the movie Blackula was that that was that William Marshall was the one who brought that to the movie. Yeah. Um, the, the you know the original draft of the script like Blackula was like a slave or something like that who was bit by a slave master. You know it was it was it was exactly what we would imagine it to be <laughs> uh, with a title like that. And you know and that film to me more so than all the other black exploitation horror movies. Um, you know, if you, if you watch it, and, and Tan and Reeve talked about this, you know, there's, there is there is like this corny aspect to it. The name in and of itself is kind of corny, but mm -hmm. uh, like, if you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> like he gets killed by the cops at the end, right. you know? And, and like, all he's trying to do is reunite with the love of his life. He's, he's, right. he's very different than a lot of the, this, um, he's more of the tragic vampire. He's a very tragic character. And, and I remember the last time I watched the movie was literally the day the, the, the cop who killed Mike Brown was acquitted. Mm. And, and I remember watching that and just going, okay, everything we're seeing in this movie right here, right now speaks to a reality that we're still living, which is the brutality of the police. And, 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 us being viewed as monsters right, right. when we're actually royalty, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, was that fully what they were trying to do in 1972? I I can't say for sure, but it's definitely, um, 
it, 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 there's, there's a relevance to it. And even like you could take the worst of the black exploitation horror movies, which is, which is Blackenstein, which is one of the worst <laughs> movies of all time. Um, but, yeah. the, but the interesting thing about Blackenstein is like, it could have been something important, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the character was a, was a Vietnam vet who was injured, you know, who, who was lost his limbs and then he gets turned into a monster. And it's like, man, if you had just, if this movie had just not been made by idiots, you know, it might've been, but these are the same people who were, who were going to make black the Ripper. So, right. um, you know, they they, they, for better or worse, we never got black the Ripper. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think that, you know, the, the, to me, the horror movies that we've seen, especially as of late, you know, Get Out, Us, um, any any film that we've seen after made after, say, 1980, mm -hmm. it's all, you know, they're the children and grandchildren of black exploitation. They wouldn't mm -hmm. have been they wouldn't have been made. I don't care how how successful they were, how expensive they were. Mm -hmm. they, they have their roots, just like black exploitation has its roots in the race films of the, the 20s and the 30s, the Oscar Michaud films and the, the right. you know, Spencer Williams and all that sort of stuff, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, you know, it's funny, I was, um, I watched uh, Black uh, Scream, Blackula Scream last yeah. night, <laughs> first in a long time, and also uh, Sugar Hill right after. Oh, nice. Just to kind of get into the mindset, you know, of the funky, you know, yeah, yeah. work, right? And I was thinking about like the end of like, cause you're talking about the tragic uh, vampire, uh, scream, Blackula Scream, and it, it already in the title implies his trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Which is and the other thing is that, you know, he's just basically trying to be free of his curse. And so Pam Greer actually is trying to help him to a certain degree through the technology of hoodoo, right? To actually free his free his soul from, you know, so I, I thought that was really interesting. And then of course, you know, in the, in um, Sugar Hill, we we're using, uh, you know, voodoo and, and other types of African diasporic Technologies and religions as a as a means to revenge, right? Um, so, I, and I, I just I just found it really interesting, you know, as far as like you're talking about this idea of a tragic vampire, because he definitely is. So, um, so Dr. Brooks, Kenitra, um, you um, are one of the predominant scholars in, on Afrofuturism, probably you know in the, in the country at the moment, right? I mean, you've been doing like this really wonderful. You are stop it. You, if you teach four hundred four hundred people about Afrofuturism, that's that's probably. 400 level and 400 people in one class learning about Afrofuturism. If you talk that <laughs> class, so you can actually wear that mantle, okay? And Tim uh, is a is a um, preeminent uh, visual Afrofuturist too, from you know from back in the day. He's like OG Afrofuturist as he as he's been as he's been titled, you know, sometimes <laughs> with his, his artwork. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about, Anita, what is Afrofuturism uh, in your view? And how do you see it intersecting with, you know, what we've been calling, you know, either the ethnographic or black horror? And Tim kind of pick up from some of the visual aspects of, you know, visual Afrofuturism, how it relates to funk music and where you see it going, you know, in, in the future. So, and you, okay. you can see the future. And then Tim, follow up. Yeah, um, I often describe Afrofuturism as a theory of time mm -hmm. and where time is conflated. The past, present and future exist together. Um, it is not linear. Um, it can even be cyclical. Um, and I think that um, what I, I work most in is the recovery project. And a lot of Afrofuturism uh, deals with the idea of who could we be if we remembered who we were. And I focus on the remembering who we were, that recovery project of history. Mm -hmm. And just how um, David spoke about you know, Prince Mama Wude being um, a prince. Mm -hmm. um, just how you spoke about um, them using the technology of hoodoo and conjure. Mm -hmm. um, this is about recovering the ways and the knowledge and the folk ways and, that we had and bringing that to the present and then so that we can now bring it to the future, right? So we have these large cosmologies. We have like, my work right now is talking about how horror and fantasy uh, reflect the philosophy of black people, mm -hmm. right? How we view and enter the world. And we've been doing this horror thing for a while, even before uh, film and television, right? If we look back to uh, Zora Neale Hurston collecting hate stories and devil tales, right? right? Um, we have been people interested in horror 
as a valid form of entertainment, but also a valid form of reflecting our cosmologies of voodoo, of voodoo, of santeria. And that these are technologies that allow us to change reality, mm -hmm. right? You know, we can change reality uh, with these technologies and that horror uses them and recognizes the importance of voodoo, recognize the importance of voodoo and conjure and of santeria. Um, and though sometimes it's um, portraying it in problematic ways, a lot of times I got into the study of this because of my interest was piqued, right? And I was like, wait, what is that 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 woman's doing? Mm -hmm. And I know they have a bone in their nose, but wait, what are they saying and talking about and doing? Mm -hmm. And um, we just have to pick, pick people's interests, pick, pick, I don't know, attract pick. people's interests. <laughs> 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 no, right? <laughs> um, get them asking those questions. And I think horror is a way that allows that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, Tim, so you have you have some uh, some deeper knowledge around some of these spiritual technologies too. I mean, I know, and I think that probably pops up in some of your visual Afrofuturist work too. Can you talk a little right, bit? About I don't know. Huh? Right, I don't know if it's deeper, but it's there. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, uh, my 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 purpose uh, right now is my focus. I'm a graphic novelist, so my my focus right now is basically um, collecting all of the 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 experiences that I've been through over the last 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, and just summing them up into sequential stories, whether that be animated, still you know, panel to panel, or even live action film. And uh, Afrofuturism, just to, you know, I guess to piggyback off of what Kanitra was saying, you know, I try to keep it simple. It's just taking black culture and intersecting it with some elements of science fiction and technology, uh, but you imbue that with race theory, social, political, economics, those type of things. And, uh, but with me, a heavy dollop of pop culture on top of it. <laughs> um, so I started in the comic book industry in the late, mid, late eighties, 86. Um, so uh, while though I, I'm not part of the academy, even though I've taught for, for many years, uh, I, my, uh, I'm uh, more like a walking fossil at this point. Um, so <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. I'm a walking fossil. So I, I, I meaning I'm not dead yet. So the first, uh, well, it's true. It's true. The first uh, cartooning work I did was for the Village Voice in eighty six. Well, in nineteen eighty seven, the first person story I ever did was talking about Al Sharpton as Papa Legba, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that was an article written by Greg Tate. Mm -hmm. And the person who got me in past the front door to get me to Greg was Darius James who wrote Negrophobia, Phobia. which yeah. I would work for a year later on a book called, um, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, for, for a magazine called Between C and D. So I've, I've had different incarnations where I've worked in editorial cartooning for mainstream, uh, for the mainstream, whether that would be with early hip hop, uh, but I also did many of the early flyers for the Black Rock Coalition for the Stalking Head shows. Um, God, I remember Cassandra Wilson and, and and Greg Osby and Steve Coleman and all those folks with M Bay. So a lot of the stuff I was doing visually intersected with music. So mm -hmm. it was not only doing it editorially, uh, but I was also doing it within my work. And that would go into a project that I conceived called Black Metropolis. And Black Metropolis was initially a kind of a sci-fi retelling of uh, the uh, Ogun, the love, or what I call the, the the love triangle between you know Ogun, uh, 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 oh well, just just uh, Yorba Risha. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. And uh, I'm by the way the worst Yorba priest on the planet. Uh, uh, I'm horrible. <laughs> it, is, it is true. I didn't it is true. about you, Tim. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, you know, my 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 job right now is to 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 air all of that. Uh, publicly, as my book will be released on January 19, 2021. So, did that, intersected with hip hop. I uh, worked for Marvel Music, did a 63 page fully painted 
graphic novel on Dr. Dre, unpublished. Uh, got out of the comic book industry and came back due to John and Stacy Robinson uh, to start Maddie's Rocket, uh, which was conceived back in the 90s. And like piggybacking on uh, what Kenitra said, it's the anthropological study to take that work that my parents didn't see as young kids and to bring that into a modern kind of modern day depiction. And Infinitum, of course, uh, for those who read, I don't know if you got a Kenitra in the mail the other day, but that's just something that deals with the totality of what I see Afrofuturism is. And uh, that's my story. Go for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, I was thinking about this uh, from an archival standpoint. All of us are, in some ways, uh, radical archivists, you know? All of us have, yeah, it's like a radical archiving that's happening of, of Black culture, like all of us, you know, I was just looking at the people on the, you know, in this panel, by documentation, by, you know, I work with a, the science fiction archive here at, at um, University of California, Riverside. We have the Eaton archive here, you know, um, criticism, collection, pedagogy, all these different types of like studying the particular culture to, to save it for future generations. I mean, that's that's definitely like a really uh, powerful through line. You know, even Infinitum by itself is like an arc, it's a visual archive of like black speculative culture and also, you know, um, black history. Thank you. And, and, you know, so all of us are, in, are involved in that, you know, on a, on a uh, and I call it like a radical archivist kind of project. So. Uh, and it just dawned on me, you know, when, we were, when, you, when you said that. So um, I want to want to get back to this idea of the intersections between Afrofuturism, which is dealing with like, you know, the cyborg prosthetic te technology, you know, like you said, socio political ideas, and Black horror. What what are the intersections between those two things? Because they're definitely related in some way. And maybe it depends. Like for instance, you look at something like Octavia Butler's Kindred, right, which is a time travel story that doesn't involve a time machine. It's what I call um, I made up a big word for it, <laughs> dineochromosomatic travel, is what I call it. That's a big word. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. It's just what it is. Yeah, if you think about it, you know, wait, let me explain. I don't know what that is. That's the thing. No one knows what it is, David. That's <laughs> the point. No, it's a neologism. Anyway, um, so yeah, so dinea means pain. You know, chrono, of course, means time, and somatic deals with the body. And a lot of times, so dineochromosomatic travel. So if you look at stuff like Captain Blackman, you know, which is by uh, John Williamson, where he's it's a time travel story about this gentleman who's wounded, who's jumping into different bodies, you know, mm. like part of me, you know, it's it's, a, it's my homeboy from Mississippi. Um, you look at something like, um, you know, uh, 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 the, the Mark Twain story, um, where a guy gets uh, it's called um, a Confederate Yankee in King Arthur's in King Arthur's Court. I think he's hit by a cart or something, or he's he's injured, or so he has a head wound or something, and he wakes up in King Arthur's Court. You know, or if you look at Kindred, of course, which is dealing a great deal with trauma, you know, or if you look at, say, uh, that episode of uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where you have like Avery Brooks's character who's going through kind of a, uh, it's called uh, Far Beyond the Stars, where he actually imagines himself as a science fiction writer in the past. You know, there's there's these different types of like, the energy for the, for the time travel is is generated through like a type of pain, you know, and I always found, so, but Kindred to me is a horror story, <laughs> you know, it's, and we got a Bram Stoker Award for the adaptation of it. It's a horror story, but it also has these um, other tropes in it that are that, that kind of become like science fictional. So I guess I kind of unpack a little bit more anybody about like the connections between what we look as like futuristic, you know, uh, you know, fantasy, and also these uh, these kind of like traumas that 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 can only be called horror from a, from an affective kind of like standpoint. You know, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm making sense, right? I'm just okay. Never mind. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> I just love so much what Kanitra Brooks said. Who could we be if we remembered who we were? Oh. And this is a thread to me that just is the engine for my personal work as a mm -hmm. horror creator. Um, it is about preserving the history. The the answer to the mystery is always in the history. Uh, and a lot of what I write, it's just you have to know what came before. You have to know what Grandma Marie did. You have to undo it. You have to learn it. And that's what gives you the strength and the nutrients to, to be strong enough to face the future and create the future. So for me, um, and the way I teach Afrofuturism is very broad because it's the Black speculative arts to me. So horror is nestled right in there in the fantasy element, uh, Get Out is science fiction horror. Art. That's right. 
Yeah. Although it's not the black character's agency that creates it, unfortunately, he's a victim yeah. of it. Right. Um, so he's been victimized by someone else's technology. But at the same time, I do see them all as so closely related. And it's not surprising that we're so fixated with time travel. Mm -hmm. Because there has been so much trauma in history and it's still in our DNA, you know, and we're passing it on to our children without even telling them the story. But they can tell by the way we flinch or the way, you know, you don't want to touch. My mother didn't like to hug. Uh, what happened to her? You know what I mean? So even if you don't say it, it's there in your house with you. And it's this constant puzzle we're trying to solve <laughs> so that we can just move forward and thrive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so... I'm thinking about these connections between, say, like, you know, um, what do you call it? Like people who are in the kind of the pantheon of Afrofuturism, like Sun Ra, his connection to people like George Clinton and other performers, and his and his connection to people like Janelle Monae. Mm -hmm. And when I think about like the dual sides of the of the black speculative, you have these really really forward thinking, you know, um, over the top, you know, celebratory, joyous representations. You also have these more like um, things that are coming from like these darker rooted, rooted spaces that are dealing with the Gothic and dealing with like, you know, I guess what, what some will call the Astro and the black, you know, because he has a song Astro black, you know, mm -hmm. and um, the Astro is almost to me like the, the metaphysical, you know, outside the box thinking about, that's where the funk I think is kind of comes in, right? It's almost like the funk is like the source code, you know, for the universe to a certain degree. Then you also have the black, which is dealing with the murky, uh, technology that we've always been dealing with, which is race, you know, I mean, race is a technology to a certain degree. Um, why do you think that there's such an interest, like an interest in horror now, though, and about black speculative culture now in this moment? Because we've had a massive resurgence of interest in Afrofuturism, black speculative culture, fantasy. I mean, if you right now, if you have a story about a black elf in outer space, you might get it picked up on Netflix. You know what I'm saying? You better like, hurry or somebody else is going to beat you. I know. <laughs> I know, right? Yes. What do you think about that? I mean, because all of you have, I mean, Kenitra has like, been nominated twice for like Bram Stoker Award for her for her research and also for her editing. Uh, Tanana Reeve is like amazing. It's like a, almost like a, just a legend in like, you know, in, in horror. You know, Tim has been doing like, I mean, he has a book with Harper Collins on Afrofuturism. Um, and this dude, David, <laughs> is like our Eisner Award winning. Uh, comic book creator and 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 his and his comics have been picked up for development for a film, you know. And Brian Cooler is a producer on it, so it's like something something's jumping off. What do y'all think that is, though? I guess. So I'm sorry to embarrass y'all. Yeah. Oh, oh, super famous and and awesome, and you're not pretending you're, you're not. So I'm gonna. Although my background is not as scholarly as the rest of you, um, I think we have just grown into wanting to see something other than the slave movie. And I think people's appetite for film has just changed over the last, let's say 10, 15, if not 20 years. And although the films from the 70s is very nostalgic for a large portion of us, baby boomers and, and Gen X and whomever else might might find them interesting. I think our appetite for film has just changed. And I think, you know, um, when I look at our history, it is a horror movie, as the two of you have written so eloquently about. Right. And I think we, as a race of people, have been the time travelers and we have fantasized about what it would be like if we are not here in this present moment, whether it is slavery, Jim Crow, uh, reconstruction and so forth. And I think the weight of all of that has just made us as a race, just very tired. Mm. You know, we're angry, but you know, for some of us, we have to contain that anger um, because we have jobs to keep we have to perform, we have to be the magical Negro when we go to work and mm. you know, we just let it all out when we come home if we're not blessed to be in a position to do our own thing. Right. And it's just an exasperating experience as we all know to be black anywhere. And I think we're just really starting to come into our own because as Lorene and I have 
discussed, you know, history always repeats itself. Mm. And we are just at that point where, you know, like 50 years ago, we made a turn to the left where everything was starting to change or maybe a turn to the right. And I think we're there again. Mm. But as it relates to entertainment, we just want to see something other than what we have been fed, what we have been forced to be fed, what yeah. people who decided what we needed to see gave us. Yeah. And now that we have, you know, stockpiled some cash and have some independence and we are able to take our visions and put them on paper and put them on film or you know even get a two by four camera and put it up on youtube we are telling our own stories and that's really what's kind of happened with the museum of uncut funk although we are not storytellers we're preserving the history because there's so many people that don't look like us that are preserving this history and that was one of the things why we started to do what we decided to do. But I just think we're tired and we want to see something else. It's mm. just that time. Mm. Mm -hmm. I wrote um, a book called uh, Searching for Cigarettes, Black Women's Haunting of Contemporary Horror. And I think I, I wrote it because folks told me that Black women weren't interested in horror mm -hmm. and that Black women horror fans didn't exist. And I knew that I became a horror fan because of my aunts and watching scary movies from the 70s and 80s with them uh, every weekend I spent by their house. So I also think it's the realization that we exist and those of us who are creators, who are artists, having the opportunity to now uh, feed ourselves. You know, Toni Morrison says, if you can't find the book you want to read, then write it yourself. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't find the film that we yeah. wanted to see. We couldn't find the comic book that we wanted to see. We couldn't find the novel that we wanted to see um, that included blackness, horror, science fiction, fantasy, all of those different parts of who we were and who we are. Um, and, and that our our ancestors were fans of, but couldn't couldn't uh, make it past that point where they had the power to actually create um, mm -hmm. for popular culture. And I think that is also an important part. We exist and we're able to show that we exist through our art. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's interesting because Kenitra hit the, she, I mean, she, my favorite Toni Mo Morrison quote, um, which is something that I live by. <clears throat> and, I, and I think that, you know, for myself as a creator, one of the things that informs me is, you know, what I didn't see when I was a kid growing up right. and, 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 or even into my twenties and thirties, twenties and thirties, what I wasn't seeing, what do I want to create? And that's representations of, of black folks, primarily black folks, but other folks too, that, that were foreign or missing to me. And, and I, you know, and the interesting thing though, is I, I have no interest, like, so, so Pamela said this, I don't, I don't need to see another slave movie, right? I really don't. But I don't ever want to see a movie that forgets that part of the Black experience in America is rooted mm -hmm. in the history of slavery, right? And, and I'm dealing with this now with this, with this one project where it's like, they can't get past the slavery aspect. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, this isn't a slavery story, but mm -hmm. it is rooted in history. And if you can't, you know, this, this goes back to, you know, how do we know who we are if we don't know who we were or where mm -hmm. we came from? And, and so it's, it's interesting to me because at least in terms of, of American pop culture, and if we're going to get into the black experience, there's a lot of trauma there and, and we have to talk about it in order to understand, you know, what's scary to black folks is, is right, something right. completely different than what's scary to white folks. Mm -hmm. And and only now are they, you know, now with the the protests that we've been seeing the last few months are, are some people really getting, oh, now we get why you're afraid of the cops. And, you know, now we get why, you know, what what your definition of, of horror is. And, and um, but it's also just interesting because the gatekeepers of, of, you know, not just horror, but just pop entertainment, has they just chose to exclude us. Yeah. And and because of that exclusion, it 
it sort of is drilled in our heads that we don't belong, right? So there's this notion that, that we as black folks don't go camping because we were never in the Friday the 13th movies, right? <laughs> there's a notion that there were no black cowboys because there was no black folks in a John Wayne movie. Right. And, and so film, which is, um, is an extension of the white mythology of the white existence, just left us out. You know, and, and so, you know, I find myself arguing with people all the time going, no, just because it wasn't in movies doesn't mean we weren't there. We weren't doing it. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's why um, I, I feel like, you know, people are constantly talking about the comic that I co-write, Bitter Root. And they're saying, you know, how did you know, how did you guys come up with this and, and where did it come from? And it's like, well, it's there, you know, like everything we're writing about is it's just nobody it's not that nobody thought to do it it's just they didn't they sought permission right <laughs> and i said uh, we're just going to do this the reason why we started collecting um the artifacts that we did is because we looked around and we saw that white people were collecting all this stuff right they were collecting it and driving the prices up so black people couldn't buy it and it was like okay you know not only do we need to find a way to collect our own history but, you know, kind of whoever has the artifacts gets to tell the story, right? So, you know, the fact that you would talk about there were no black cowboys. Well, you know, we have, you know, artifacts that, that prove that differently. You right. know, the fact that you say, you know, there were no, you know, black this in film, black that in film. And we've got posters that show we were everything in film in the 70s. And over 200 films made. And they were made, you know, distri distributed all over the world. I mean, we've got posters from everywhere. You know, to show that black stories and black film, again, we can debate, you know, the merits of the films that were made, but they, you know, they were shown everywhere. I mean, we've got posters from, you know, Yugoslavia and Egypt, mm -hmm. all kinds of places that you would have never thought, you know, a black film was distributed. So it's, it's important to, you know, just kind of challenge the notions of what we aren't, right? And where, and where people say we haven't been and what we haven't done, because we have. Um, we just need to tell those stories because it's it's not in other people's best interest to tell them. You know, we're we're the you know what we're realizing is we are really the the keepers of our own history. Mm -hmm. You know, because the the movement is to not teach our history, to not tell anybody about our contributions, because it's easier to devalue us if you really truly believe that we've contributed nothing. We have no value. So. It's, it is important to be, you know, a radical archivist and to be, uh, you know, a militant archivist and to, you know, shout it as loud as possible. You know, we have been, you know, contributors to this country, you know, in many ways, but definitely driving, you know, culture, you know, driving, you know, all kinds of culture for the entire time we've been here. I mean, we are very creative people. <laughs> you, know, we, you know, we've driven every genre of music you know, since we were, since we were brought here. So, you know, it, it, it really is important, you know, what everybody is doing to just continue to, you know, to beat back all of these, you know, stereotypes and notions that, you know, we don't, that we don't belong in places that we haven't been in places when we really have been everywhere. We belong everywhere. We've contributed everywhere. And, you know, we've got the, you know, the artifacts to prove it. We've got the, you know, the, the history to prove it. And it's, you know, it's just particularly today, when there is really a, a concerted effort to, to try to, you know, erase, you know, our history and, er and whitewash, you know, our story um, right. that, you know, we don't forget about slavery, but that we actually tell the story so that the important parts are told, not just the same old tired things that you see over and over again. That's right. That's right. One of my uh, biggest regrets is that I never had this conversation with my mother, you know, mm -hmm. because because like Kanitra and, and I think like you, John, uh, it was women, you know, who brought horror to me. This right. love for black women had this love for horror. And I never got a chance to ask her why she thought it was. So I have my own theory that it's directly related to her trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, having been a civil rights activist, had a tear gas canister thrown in her face when she mm -hmm. was in college at Florida A&M University, wore dark glasses even indoors mm -hmm. her whole adult life, 80% of the time after that. So she's wearing this literal scar from the civil rights era, all that fear 
So you project that onto a zombie, a monster, a vampire. You know, she raised us on those creature feature movies. And I think it's that. And there were Black artists uh, who saw the value of the speculative lens to help better reflect reality, both to Blacks and, and whites. You know, like I think when W.E.B. Du Bois wrote The Comet, uh, he wrote that as much for a white audience uh, or maybe more than a Black audience about a black man and a white woman who are the last two survivors of a post-apocalyptic event. It's like, look, we're human too. Yep. Look, look, you put them together. Hey, the world doesn't explode because a black man and a white man are together. <laughs> and 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 we we exist, we're here, we're human just like you. Just that plea, we, you know, I mentioned Spencer uh, Williams and, and you had Bill Gunn with Ganja and Hess and Eve's Bayou. I mean, we had the artists, we had mm -hmm. the artists trying to put forward the work. Yeah and never succeeding upward, <laughs> you know, the way they should have, they would, we would succeed down for some reason. Uh, and then there was this, this great event, uh, Get Out, uh, by, oops, there it is, Jordan Thank Peele, you. that showed Hollywood, oh shoot, $250 million? Mm. <laughs> that is so sick, I can't even, you know, there's been a lot of black horror before Get Out, but I cannot express enough, you know, if I'm taking all these meetings, I have things in development I can't even talk about yet, mm -hmm. in an unprecedented way. It's the same stories <laughs> that have been out since 1995. It's the times mm -hmm. that have risen to us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when Dr. Robin Armin's Coleman wrote, was trying to write horror noir toward her tenure, her department was like, mm, that's not weighty enough. But she has opened the door for so many other scholars now to, right. to write about black speculative arts in a way that is treated with respect, that the times are definitely changing. And I would say probably in great part because of the work, the yeah. work that those people have, before us have been doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, totally true. I mean, I teach three classes on Afrofuturism, three different classes, just <laughs> Wow. They're crazy, you know? Um, and so, I almost didn't get tenure because I wrote about black women in horror. See? Yeah. See? So it hasn't quite changed enough, but you yeah. were able to squeak well, by. I mean, it has now because, you know, I, I other universities and things like that recognize and could see what it was and get out and caught on that wave as well. Yeah. The academic um, game is just as hungry uh, as uh, Hollywood. The movie mm -hmm. Hollywood. Good point. Yeah, we talked a little bit about some of the earlier... Um, you know, precursors, like you were saying, the Comet and, you know, um, Of One Blood by Pauline Hopkins and, you know, George Schuyler's um, Black No More. Or, you know, stuff like that. What are some of the things that you're really into right now, really quickly? Uh, and then I had like a follow-up question before we kind of like start, you know, winding down. I, what are some of the things that, that you feel are getting it right right now? Besides the get out and stuff like that, what's, what, what are some other things that you are or, or even stuff that you wish was better, <laughs> you know, on the other side. What, what's some things that you wish had been done better, like right now? Because because I know all, we're all consuming a lot of media right now. So. Well, Kenitra, I know you're <laughs> writing about it uh, all the time. <laughs> Love Crowd Country Love is Crowd Country. so it is exciting. Amazing. So exciting. You know, nothing is perfect, but every episode has so much packed in so much that it's trying to undo so many spaces that it's trying to populate where we were erased. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Tulsa episode just took me out. Woo! I, was, I was in my feelings the whole time. I really could not even sleep right that night. You know, it was just wow. Just it, it, yeah, it's again, uh, time travel narrative. Oh it, my god! Trauma. I mean, I told you my little theory that y'all are making fun of. You know, I know it's a big word, but it, but there's something there. You know, so anyway. <laughs> there is something there. There's a lot yeah. there. Yeah. Right, because she was using her body not to. I don't, you know what, Lorraine, I'm not going to spoil it for you because Lorraine's uh, like, I'm going to watch it. Eventually. I'm only on episode four, so I look forward oh, to it. Oh, yeah. I've been, I've been hearing, hearing about it. it. What are y'all interested right now? He's been talking me through it. He's been talking really me through doing, it. Really doing it for you. Because Lovecraft Country, right? Uh, what else? What else we got? There's what also a the of um, <laughs> Black YA horror. I mean, horror fantasy, you know, sci-fi fantasy. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just churning these out. We've got all these authors. We have uh, Tommy Adeyemi's The Children of Broad and Bone. Right. And uh, Brown just released uh, A Song of Wraith and Ruin. Oh, um, yeah. you oh know, Ring Shout just came out, too. Uh, Ring Shout just came mm -hmm. out by P.J. Jelly Clark. 
um, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. also have these young women as protagonists. Yeah. Um, what is that? L. L. McKinney has a Blade So Black, which is a retake, a fantasy retelling of uh, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. So we've got all this literature that will then result <laughs> in all these films, right? Um, yeah. They are popping and coming out, and they're so good. They're so good. Definitely. And I mean, Definitely. I could never imagine something like that when I was a preteen or a teenager or something like that. I was I was reading Christopher Pike. That's who I had to read. Christopher Pike and Stephen King. That that was my reading. That was my heart. And R.L. Stein, right? Oh, yeah, R.L. Stein, yeah. There was no way that I could have gotten a song of Wraith and Ruin. I could have gotten a Blade So Black. There's just no way. Right. What about you, David? You had to, or you tell me anything that y'all are oh, into right I'm now? I'm so out of it, man. You know, I really <laughs> am. I, I, <laughs> there's, there, I'm at that phase where I'm not watching much or reading much for, for a host of reasons, in part because I'm trapped in my own mind and what I'm right. trying to, to do. Yeah. I'm trying to create. I, I, I rewatched um, The Girl with All the Gifts the other oh, day. A great film. And, and yeah. I was, you know, and, and I, I really like that movie a lot. And and I think part of what I like about that movie is that all the things that, that we can read into it without it being smashed over our head or smashed in our face, where, you know, I, I always go back to the, the movie that had the biggest impact on me, or one of the movies that had the biggest impact on me was, was Night of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it always comes back to the fact that they they didn't beat you over the head with what Dwayne Jones was supposed to represent. You you brought your own thing to it. So I'm watching it at 12 years old for the first time going, well, you can make a movie about what it's like to be a black man in America. And, you know, this is what I took from it at 12 years old. Um, and, and so when I watched Girl with All the Gifts, I kind of had that feeling again, too, because it was like, you know, she could just be, like she's just a girl. Right. You know? And and yet she's something more, yeah. and uh, and and so I've been you know it's interesting because as Kenitra was some of those titles I was like oh, I need to I need to get caught up because I I really do feel like I'm I see that there's a lot of YA stuff coming out that uh, I know I should be reading. Meanwhile, I'm trying to get a deal for my YA book, so it's like I don't want to you know uh, get caught up in in that too much, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, Lovecraft Country. I, I'm gonna wait till the final episode drops, and then I'll get HBO, and then I'll watch the whole thing, and then I'll get, and then I'll get mad that I, you know, I mean, we're, you know, I, I, I sometimes lose sight of the fact that, you know, I'm part of the team that's doing Bitter Root, and and that's that's doing its own little thing in in this yeah. world that we're talking about. So. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I guess I I would add that uh, for myself, I'm just not. Right now, I mean, I'm certainly, I, you know, I've looked, I've seen a few of the episodes of Lovecraft Country, but my focus right now has really been trying to make sure that the works that I individually am producing and just, uh, they need to be really, it, things have to be tight right yeah. now. I, I guess that's a little bit weird for me because I mean, I envy you prose writers, you guys got your stuff out, y'all have a culture that's been around for many, many years on the mainstream level. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain level of comfort that I guess, you know, you guys can take from that. Whereas for myself, you're talking about a massive 280 page fully painted graphic novel released by freaking Harper Collins. It's like, oh God, I could destroy, I could destroy the industry before it even, <laughs> it could be stillborn. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, oh my God, uh, uh, what am I going to do? So I, that's what my focus is right now. Right now, uh, I remember uh, listening to an interview with Jeffrey Osborne, uh, mm. the soul singer, and he was talking. They were talking about how is it that he found his voice. He said there was a point where he stopped listening to other people, mm. and he only listened to himself. And that began for me a few years ago. Uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, destroyed a few friendships along the way, but uh, I found that uh, I was compelled to really focus and to really, uh, 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 I'm compelled to finish my work mm -hmm. and compelled to see if it is even possible within the graphic novel space to make a statement, not just a, 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 a written narrative statement, but a visual narrative statement that moves the needle 
Uh, and so that's that's what I'm into. I'm into I'm into Tim at this point. I'm sorry. I know that sounds selfish, but that's what it is. I'd be lying if I didn't say that. That's very honest. Um, you know, actually, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the last question I was going to pose is probably a little dark. You know, I, so you know what? So I want to keep it light. I'm going to keep it funky. And I want to talk about the future. You know, so what, um, because we're coming up on, like, a, you know, we're coming up on the end of this. And I wanted to make sure that people talked about um, things that they're working on right now, if, if you can, because some things are super secret. Like tonight, we've got a lot of, a lot of stuff in it, probably in it, <laughs> going on right now. And, uh, you know, and we, and we, we have things that we can, we can talk about. So, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll be last, but obviously, you know, the Museum, Museum of Uncut Funk has got some stuff going on. Uh, we can start with y'all and just kind of work around so we can, you know, celebrate that in these scary times. This is coming out on, uh, October 31st, Halloween. Uh, we're living in some really terrifying times right now, but I want to keep it, you know, let's keep it joyous about like our black creativity moving forward. So what are y'all working on right now? Well, we're, as we opened up with, we're relaunching, developing some new, uh, new uh, merchandise for our store, revamping that, uh, working with you and a number of other people within the industry to create um, some products as it relates to some of our um, uh, artifacts that we have and, um, you know, starting a nonprofit and just really trying to get this ball rolling mm -hmm. uh, with the museum. You know, unfortunately, COVID has put a halt on all of our traveling exhibitions. So hopefully that will, you know, start back up in 2022. Um, cause 2021, I think we're still all going to be sequestered in and dealing with this and hopefully we'll have a president by then. Um, Lorraine, is there anything you want to add? Oh, I should say a new president by yeah, then. President, how about that? Um, you know, we're looking at some different things. I, you know, I think, you know, Pam mentioned that we're starting a nonprofit. Um, we're seriously looking at building a physical museum one day, um, mm -hmm. hopefully soon. We to have a place where people can come and uh, experience the 70s in a different way and celebrate the funk. So that's something that is uh, high on our list um, because we really can't tour exhibitions. We are looking at um, what we can do with you know, the things that we have in our collection to continue to educate people. A lot of the, the audience for our exhibitions were school age children, a lot of school trips to the various museums that we we're dealing with. So that is something that um, that is missing right now. So we're looking at developing curriculum and creating educational games and things around um, aspects of our collection and, um, you know, working with folks like John to bring some of the uh, vintage comic properties that we have um, to life, you know, to give kind of 2.0 versions of some of them, which is going to be very exciting. So there'll be new uh, creative stories, you know, coming from the Museum of, of Uncut Funk through our partnerships with various um, very talented uh, black uh, creators in the future. So a lot of different things we're working on. Um, a lot more, which we'll talk about uh, on the 31st. Mm -hmm. uh, during our, uh, you know, our uh, kind of meet the founders event that we'll be doing virtually on that day. Um, so, you know, certainly would love for everybody to come and, uh, and check it out. We're going to kind of lay out our vision for what we're going to be doing in the future. But I, I actually do want to throw something in there before before we close. I, I'm just curious as to how everybody got into kind of what they're doing, because, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, um, you know, aunties and mamas and, you know, it sounds like the, the women, you know, have kind of passed all of this creativity on, um, you know, from generation to generation. I, you know, I'm not a huge horror fan. Um, I'm trying. John's helping me. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working, you know, I got through the first Lovecraft and I, you know, I need a little break, but I'm going to pick it back up. I'm, keep it up. <laughs> I'm, a funk, I'm a funk girl, you know, and I, you know, just like David, you know, I was a little too young to go to the movies. Mom wouldn't let me see all the R-rated movies, but she wouldn't let me go to see any concert I wanted to see. So that's how I got hooked on funk. Like I could go to all the concerts, but couldn't go see the movies. So yeah. that's how I got kind of, you know, hooked on uh, P-funk, you know, seeing the mothership come down. Um, was just a life-changing thing for me. So, and that that was all due to my mom. I'm not sure she understood what she was doing at that time. 
it definitely turned me out of the funk. So, I, you know, I'm just curious as to, you know, as, as you go around and talk about the future and what everybody's doing, just to, you know, step back into the past and just, you know, how did, did you all become, you know, the brilliant folks that you, that you've become, but, you know, so focused on Afrofuturism and horror and, and really pioneering in this, in this space. And, you know, I, I kind of talked to, to um, John about it. It's fascinating that, you know, something that is so rooted in black culture, black people have managed to own. A lot of times when we, when we pioneer something, we, we don't own it, right? Other people co-opt it and they kind of, you know, take it in different directions. But, you know, this is, is an area where, you know, there's, there's just a lot of, of um, you know, black millions, black scholarship. Um, and and it's, it's really something I think very special, particularly given the Renaissance that's going on now and the fact that, you know, black folks are out in front of it and leading it. Mm -hmm. so. Anybody want to? Um, so how I got in and I spoke about my aunts and that's my father's side, mm -hmm. but I, I'm born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And on my mother's side, I found out that I came, my great grandmother was a conjure woman and I come from 10 plus generations of healers. And so that is where my interest in conjure and hoodoo come from. Um, I am currently working on a project that looks at conjure women as philosophers, mm. um, as cosmologists, as world builders, right? Um, and also look at how that um, influences uh, Black women fantasy writers like N.K. Jemison and uh, Nettie Okorafor and Nalo Hopkinson. Um, I currently, I just had an essay called The Dead Still Crave De Dessert, um, published in Gravy Magazine. And it's a short story, uh, I mean, it's a short essay about me baking a pound cake for my grandmother, who's an ancestor. Mm. And it talks about my relationship with the dead in my family um, and that tradition on my mother's side of the family coming from southeastern Louisiana. Uh, I'm also writing the Lovecraft Country uh, recaps, dive-ins, um, and I'm going to teach next semester a Lovecraft Country course. It needs its own course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I already have my my lectures. I mean, really, it's like it, yeah. <laughs> you know, planned out and um, my reading list and everything else. So I'm going to teach the course, um, following in the path of my Beyonce, my lemonade course, mm -hmm. <laughs> might as well keep it going. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's what I'm working on. And that's how I got into that? horror and conjure and root work. And uh, I'm a practitioner as well as a theorist. You're not going to mention the other project? You can mention it. I mean, you said it. Can I? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, am a daft I didn't know, but he might. Yeah, you know what? They're going to stop us. I, I am adapting um, N.K. Jemison's Red Dirt Witch into a graphic novel uh, with Ashley Woods as the illustrator. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm so excited because it's basically a conjure woman against like Faye, right. um, the Faye from Ireland. And it's like the meeting of like, you know, Black, you know, folk magic versus Irish folk magic. And it's so awesome. And mm -hmm. I, it's all up my, it's, yeah, it's, Can it's I get my, to edit it? my erogenous zone. <laughs> <laughs> Are we supposed to, can we say that? Anyway, never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, this is adult programming. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, David, what are you working on right now um, that, that you can talk about? Stuff that you, that's coming out as, you know, more. Well, um, you know, I'm still working. How did you get started? How did you come to this stuff too, by the way? Because that's well, a loaded question. So. All right, so I'll, it's, that, that's actually good because how I came to this is also something I'm working on now is, um, but so I'm, I'm continuing to work on Bitterroot with, uh, with Sanford Green and Chuck Brown, uh, working on the third arc right now and, and uh, have no idea what's going on with the film other than that they're, they're still moving forward with it. Um, yeah. And, and then, I have in January coming out my my new nonfiction graphic novel, which is on the history of the Black Panther Party, and um, yeah, I've been moving more towards nonfiction with uh, with some of the work that I'm doing. But what you know, what brought me to this stuff a lot was, um, you know, I was I, I just always tell people I was kind of a weird kid 
never really felt like I fit in anywhere. And so I, I sought escape through um, TV and film and comic books and, and especially anything that was somewhat otherworldly because mm-hmm. I, I never felt like I fit in with this world. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm working on a project now, which I, I call my, my fictional autobiography. It's a graphic novel that will be, everything will be true except the stuff that isn't. And, um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's all, a lot of it's rooted in my childhood and, and the things that I experienced um, as it relates to science fiction, as it relates to horror, as it relates to comics. But what also, and this is interesting because I, I hadn't thought about it much till I was listening to everybody talk, mm. where I need to, one of the things I've been thinking about what I need to explore is um, that, that other part of blackness that we don't see explored too much in, in pop culture, which is the experience that I had growing up, which was, you know, um, the biracial experience, mm-hmm. but you're still pushed over into this corner, right? Mm-hmm. But the black folks don't necessarily want you there. You know, you, you're not you're not black enough for them. You're too black for the white folks, too white for the black folks. And, and I feel like that's a voice that, um, that we're not seeing a lot of in, in, in popular entertainment. So that's one of the things I feel like, okay, you know, if I'm really gonna get at the heart and soul of who I am and my experiences um, and, and project that into my work, that's where I need to go next is, is because it's, there's more nuance to, um, to that aspect of the black experience. And, and it doesn't diminish anything that I've experienced or that I've been through, it just adds more to it. So that's one of the things that John, I'll be probably calling you in the next couple of days, mm-hmm. picking your brain about, you know, how to, how to make it work, uh, which is, which is what we do all the time anyway. Right. That sounds great. Uh, Tim and then Tanana Reed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I've been in this, I've been in the game, oof, God, since I was a young child. Um, uh, for better or worse, career has been absolutely decimated because of that fact. Uh, and now I am uh, uh, back in the game over the last few years. Uh, the project I'm working on now is, uh, well, at least I finished Infinitable, which will be out January, January 19, 2021, from HarperCollins, Amistad, uh, working on High John Conqueror, which is a freakish uh, uh, blend of uh, the works of Edgar Rice Burrow, Robert E. Howard, uh, blended with a little bit of Walt Disney. <laughs> uh, 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 and Peter Pan. Um, uh, so, I'm, uh, and uh, also romance novels, uh, which I have a fascination with trying to do that. And also bringing uh, Maddie's Rocket to a close in trilogy form. Uh, that's where my focus is right now at this moment. And I hope to be able to turn in the, well, I've done the book one, book two treatments, and now I'm working on the final treatment for book three. And uh, hopefully that will get picked up soon and uh, I can get to work back to work on that full time. Uh, let's see, what else am I doing? Uh, Black Metropolis, which will be my memoirs. I've been trying to uh, get it done and I hope to be able to really focus on that. And that will just be all of the work that I've done over the last 40 years mm-hmm. integrated with new, uh, uh, well, comic adaptations of, of my life interspr- uh, interspersed throughout. Uh, and finally, um, I'm looking forward to uh, 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 doing 10 years worth of work in five years. <laughs> and that's my goal. <laughs> See, that's what we're all doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm every day. Every day. <laughs> so, um, so many blessings. It's the weirdest mismatch. Uh, dumpster fire in the outside world and just blessings raining uh, in terms of the exposure of, of my work in particular. In my fifth career now, I'm trying to get into film and TV and adaptation. Uh, Steve and I wrote a script called The Keeper that we did actually have a production company shopping, so fingers crossed. But it's coming out as a graphic novel with John editing uh and marco finnegan doing the illustrations so it will have its own life hollywood or no hollywood 
But beyond that, uh, I guess I'm the most excited that I finished a novel over quarantine. You know, fear of death will really motivate you sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> after seven years, I finished my novel, which is called The Reformatory, which is about a haunted uh, juvenile prison, basically. And the same one, the Dozier School for Boys that Colson Whitehead wrote about in Nickel Boys. And I'm so glad there were no ghosts in his because I got lucky. He did magical realism for Underground Railroad. So when I heard about the Nickel Boys, I was like, oh no. But uh, I'll just have faith they're very different. And just as an indication of the weird times we're living in, I have not yet sold this book, but I've al I'm already in the process of optioning it. So Ooh, it's wow. just to develop it as a limited series. And I don't mind talking about it because part of the uh, the deal is they're gonna announce it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so often nobody wants to announce anything, you know, you like two years later, it's like, oh, by the way. But yeah, they're, they're going to announce optioning that. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on options that are either complete or in the process of getting complete from my novel, The Between. Mm -hmm. Which is a good house. I feel like I'm missing something, honestly. I mean, just, yeah. it's, it's been amazing. It's been, I don't even, it's like a dream, you know? So I, I don't, I'm not silly enough to think it'll last forever. So we're trying to get in while the getting's good, you know? We even were called in to, to interview to write Bitter Root. I never, you know, Steve and I were. So that we were even in the rotation of writers they would bring in. Hollywooding from you know nowhere near Hollywood at my stage of life is so unusual. <laughs> so it's, right. it's it's a very interesting time. Yeah, I I, I want to close out really quick because um you know the two books that uh, were mentioned uh, the Keeper and Red Dirt Witch are on a new imprint that I uh, uh, founded through Abrams Comic Art. It's called Megascope. Uh, our first uh, book comes out in January as as does uh, Tim's. Uh, it's called After the Rain, it's a Nettie Okora for uh, a short story adaptation that I did with David Brain, uh, and I did the colors and the adaptation on. Uh, we just dropped, me and my friend uh, Stuart Jaffe and uh, Garrett Ganey just put out a, a, a one issue piece called Blues Man through Peep Game Comics. PeepGameComics.com is a black owned uh, digital distribution, uh, comics distribution company. Uh, we're finally get, uh, ready to put out the trade paperback for uh, Box of Bones. Thank you, David, for the uh, and, and Tanary for the for the blurbs. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, and right now uh, we are me and my friend Stacy Robinson and um, Alvin Ball. You know, I'm editing a, um, a short primer for the Tulsa, about the Tulsa Race and Massacre for the for next couple. And it's looking great. I've seen yeah. the pages. Looking great. Yeah, pages are, are, are killer. So yeah, so it's due Thursday though. So wish us luck. So yeah, so that's it. So um, I guess I want to. I really want to thank y'all uh, for for this. I mean, I know that time is precious, but it's also so good to see everyone, and um, also you know to keep uh, keep each other uh, you know uh, working and thinking about these about these really serious issues, but also to kind of like always remember that you know the funk is there and like and the joy, black joy is also a. Um, it's a radical notion. Black joy is a radical notion. We have to keep our we have to keep our spirits up, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. thank y'all so much for doing this. I mean, you are blessing y'all. I was taking uh, out. Yeah. <laughs> so much stuff, right? So this was Afrofuturistic Fright Night fun Funstication. 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 So thank <laughs> y'all for, for funsticating with us, and thank you, Uncut Funk, for hosting this, and you know, thank you, thank you for all the work that we all do as archivists mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I, I wish you peace and love and thank you for the fun. Yes, of course.